Welcome uh, everyone uh, to uh, this new session of the webinar of Positive Future. Uh, welcome in, in the name of uh, all our uh, organizers. Uh, we uh, have uh, today the great pleasure of uh, welcoming uh, Marcela Sabino. Uh, Marcela is a foresight strategist. She's the creative director and innovation designer uh, with more 16 years of experience. She focuses on helping prototype more inclusive and sustainable futures on Earth and in the metaverse and in space. For the past six years, uh, Marcella was the lab director and head of innovation at the Museum of Tomorrow, uh, where she and her team developed projects on the futures of artificial intelligence, of art, of food, of fashion, of work and space using exponential uh, technologies such as AI, virtual reality, digital fabrication, robotics, big data, and the internet of things. So as, as you can see, uh, Marcela is already living in the future and uh, she's going to tell us uh, how we get there faster and well. She has worked with a lot of very prestigious institutions like the World Bank, the IFC, the IDB, the United Nations, and in corporations uh, on inclusion development and on business projects. And she holds a B in anthropology and political science from Amherst College and master in public policy and political and economic development from Harvard and a master uh, on the design entertainment from the European Institute of Design. And I will stop here because I could talk for hours, but now Marcella, I will give you the floor. So you tell us on how uh, to get our hands dirty for the urgency of prototyping better future. Marcella, thank you so much for being with us tonight. And the floor is now yours. Thank you very much, Sadi, for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, so I will start here. Uh, you've, you've gone over my bio, so I will, I will pass on that. Um, and we can start with the agenda. So uh, for today, I will go over uh, the Museum of Tomorrow and Lab to talk about how we did futures there. Um, examples of what is prototyping, uh, actual examples of prototypes, and then some uh, rapid fire exercises to get the brain thinking around this. So to start off, uh, for those of you who don't know, here is the Museum of Tomorrow. Um, that is a, a building that opened in December, 2015 in, the, in Rio, in the center in the Guanaba Guanabara Bay. Um, and we have here uh, the ethical axes of the museum, our sustainability and conviviality. Uh, so how do we wanna live with the planet and how do we wanna live with each other uh, as well as knowledge and innovation. And so the key message which, of the museum, which could also be the key message of the world today is that tomorrow is today and today is the place for action. There's not one point where uh, it becomes the future. We're always creating it and it's, it's not a destination, it's a creation every day with, our, um, with what, we, what we think, what we do, what projects we create. Um, and so the museum is really a museum organized around five main questions or provocations. So where do we come from? Who are we? Where are we? Where are we heading to? And how do we wanna go? So um, uh, in over five, six years, we've had over 5 million visitors. Uh, over 40% have not been regular museum visitors and 10% have never been to a museum. So it's a very democratic space uh, that we had there. Um, a few interesting uh, highlights about the building itself is uh, sustainability. So we have solar panels for energy, cold water harvesting for AC, for the, the, the air conditioning, uh, filtered bay water, it's taken from the, from the bay um, and, uh, and goes into the water feature, which is around the whole museum. The, this, pool of water, which also cools down the building uh, and an automated HVAC system uh, as well. And so this is a design by Santiago Calatrava and it's an interesting way of even the, this, the, the building was built in a very kind of futuristic kind of way, which we need to obviously think about given our current situation, which I'll talk about soon. Um, the visitors are tracked with an RFID system that tracks their journey uh, and speaks their language. It's a trilingual museum, English, Portuguese, Spanish. Uh, and at the end of the museum, visitors can interact with IRIS, which is an AI uh, created in partnership with IBM Watson, which is probably one of the only AIs which asks you questions rather than 
answers questions, which is what most AIs do, <laughs> but it's trying to get this idea of the museum of questions. Uh, and also this community work too. So there's over 5,000 neighbors who have a free visit card uh, and you know, in normal non-COVID years around 50 to 90%, 90,000 students uh, come per year. And there's also a program called Between Museums, which uh, gets students from lower income areas to uh, visit the museum as well as other museums. Um, and of course, a membership program as well. Um, and so I won't have time to go through everything in depth, so we have to talk about prototypes, but uh, just a few kind of snapshots about the museum so you guys get a taste of what it's about. So here you have this, this area with thousands of photos of what humans have created. So how do, we, how do we love? How do we remember? How do we produce? How do we celebrate? So there's thousands of pictures and uh, explanations from all over the world. Um, the Anthropocene is the pulsing center of the museum. It's 2000 square meters of LED lights and it shows all of the impacts of a human being on the earth. So all of the things that we have done uh, to impact the, the globe, it's in one place. You see figures for, you know, figures in real time, uh, it's connected to a real time database of pollution, of, you know, kind of fisheries, of, you know, kind of soil contamination, all these kinds of things. It's a very shocking. Uh, and, and I've definitely seen uh, grown men cry in this because it's, 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 it's something that's something to behold, uh, all the impacts that we're having as, a, as humanity on the, on the planet. Uh, teacher training. So we have some ancestral uh, uh, trainings, uh, you know, kind of uh, getting uh, uh, knowledge from the past, but also from the future as well. Um, we have the neighbors program, which I mentioned, um, you know, African matrices, which are very important in Brazil, as well as indigenous matrices. Uh, here it says on the text, uh, uh, in the past, whites have not existed. This is very relevant, right? Whites did not exist. Very relevant today where we have uh, some, some troubles with that in Brazil. In this, in this area, uh, a program showing between museums program and the entrance of the museum on the left, you see the lab, uh, which I uh, created and directed for over six years. And it's really a space here, you see the, the space that's kind of the space where we worked, where the machines were, where we experimented. Uh, and it's a space of innovation and experimentation platform at the intersection of science, art and technology. So that's what we were always working on. And uh, the idea here, what our massive transformative purpose was, is to prototype a more sustainable and social future using traditional and exponential technologies through a transdisciplinary approach. So um, this definition, which is what guided all of our different products because we worked across the spectrum, across different technologies, was prototyping, first, first of all, which is making a physical or a digital representation of the, of the thing. So it's something that's uh, functional or quasi-functional. Um, and sustainable and social are the values, the ethical axes of what we wanted to do. So I mentioned the ethical axes of conviviality and sustainability. So the social and sustainable is how is everything that we prototype had to be along those axes. Um, the way we did it was using traditional and exponential technologies. So traditional, we're using knowledge of biology, indigenous knowledge, knowledge, um, you know, traditional knowledge also, but also uh, technologies like 3D printing, AI, VR, AR, IoT, the whole, uh, the whole alphabet soup of technology over there. Uh, and always through a transdisciplinary approach, because we know that uh, the future is multiple, the problems are wicked, and so we need to use a transdisciplinary approach that will enable us not only to have different disciplines at the table, but also to get different knowledge bases connected uh, and work with those. So uh, we had uh, four main types of work that we did. So one is exhibitions, the second is fellowships, the third is workshops, and the fourth is experimentation and prototyping. So about the exhibitions, um, we had, uh, for example, this exhibition, which was a strolling through a hacked Rio. This was a kind of a provocation to the inhabitants of Rio of how to hack your city, how to see your city as if it were a computer system that's hackable. So what are possible um, hacks that you can have? So this is an example, uh, an urban garden, for example. 
you know, we have we have several in Paris here that I've seen already. So uh, the the uh, uh, urban gardens, the rooftops, you know, things like the graffiti that you know are are you know kind of uh, all all around um, the. Um, the also the book stands that you see in the city itself. So this is a really kind of a call to people to to really impact the city. And the data that we had here of people, what, what would they want to hack in their city was later used by the municipality. So this is a, an example of how you can use culture and then connect it to public policy. So Interface Interlace was a uh, an exhibition that was the culmination of five months of prototyping with um, designers, with artists, with uh, you know, fashion uh, stylists and pattern makers. And the idea here was how to see clothes as an interface between you and the world. So not just something to cover your body or to protect you from the cold, but that can um, interact with the world, that can uh, be grown. So we grew, we grew uh, biofabrics um, that uh, can, can talk about people's um, uh, people's behavior and people's uh, emotions through light, through sound, through all these kinds of things. So really, how do we think about clothing in the future? Uh, so you can see some examples here. Uh, on the left-hand side, there's a clothing for blind people to experience the museum and the museum solar panels that go up and down. The middle is a uh, transformer, um, a transformer style wedding dress that was made from kombucha, so it was grown. Question there was, what if you could grow your own clothing? Uh, so we grew this kombucha with the help of a biotech uh, uh, startup that then later launched this as a product line. So another example of how culture and you know kind of prototyping can go beyond uh, beyond the the museum, beyond the the, the original purpose. Um, so lots of accessories, so you can see shoes here, you can see uh, things 3D printed, solar shoes here in the, in the front. Uh, here's another uh, exhibition we did too, it's called Edible Future. So this was the concept of what if we can make food in the order that it's digested? So uh, we digest, you know, first carbohydrates, then proteins, then, then, then lipids and micronutrients, you know, in the stomach. So it goes through a process, but our food is not created in that way. So what if we could create, you know, food in layers and could create it from sources that are sustainable, such as in this case, um, uh, algae, uh, like spirulina, chlorella, chlorella uh, and also fungus like corn smut, which is a fungus that grows on corn, which is illegal to, 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 to work with in Brazil, as we found out, but it is uh, considered a delicacy in Peru. So sometimes these ideas of the future that we're talking about may already exist, but they may be uh, not accepted uh, in some areas. Uh, Ofisuka 2068 is an interesting project. It's the uh, Ofisuka is a Japanese word for office home. This is a project that we did in 2018. Uh, where we got uh, young people who will probably be working in this future, future of work scenario in 2068. So it was 50 years uh, forward from 2018. And um, uh, the idea there, which was interesting, especially given our COVID uh, environment, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, you, instead of working 12 months of the year, you are or 11 months of the year, uh, um, and we would we would have it would be switched around. We would work probably one month on projects of hyper creative projects. That would be the space of the human being that we thought uh, could be uh, for hyper creative projects in a world of automation and somewhat technological unemployment. Where could humans be? Well, in a hyper creative space. And so they would go to these opisukas, which are almost kind of these you know AI enabled. Um, I guess like we work spaces that are in the world that are, but that are made for specific types of projects where everybody congregates and uses a bunch of tools. Like for example, you have here, uh, uh, this would be like a prototype of a laser, um, a laser uh, printer and also kind of a, a 3D printer also two in one of biopolymer. Uh, this came from a signal we saw at the MIT Media Lab that they were working using biopolymers and they can then uh, um, how do you say, melt them down and reuse them. So imagine if in an office, you had to have a meeting one day for 20 people, you can make 20 chairs. Uh, the next day you needed to do some prototypes so you can melt that down and then it could be printed and cured again. Um, so that was the idea. 
On the left, far left, you have a gel refrigerator that was, you know, created based on, uh, you know, your specific genome. On the right side, you have a prototype of a 3D printer, a 3D printer there. And in the back, you have these pods that come out, and that's where the oneironauts go and uh, download your dreams uh, so that they can kind of uh, look at them and kind of parse them out to help you become hyper-creative. So we thought the way to become hyper-creative could be using much more of the brain. So the dreams that we have when we're not conscious or, you know, kind of the, the mentalizations we have as well. So uh, these are all uh, kind of inspired by prototypes that already exist uh, in, in laboratories in, in, in Europe and in MIT Media Lab, uh, et cetera. So here is a project that uh, we did contemplating this idea of a techno-shamanic experience in VR. It's called Repangia. Pangea, of course, was the, the continent and the idea is, is kind of what if we could um, join humanity and nature or, or nature and technology together uh, in this imaginary world where we kind of connect and, and it's not it's not in opposition as it is today, whereas we are, you know, this hyper consuming, hyper consumption, this kind of frenetic pace where we're just using, consuming, throwing away. What if we could have a, a super technological advanced relationship, but also connected with nature? So this was a, a contemplation, an artistic contemplation on that. And so three people would enter into this VR space. They would see each other and they would see uh, an indigenous holographic guide, which we actually, um, uh, we, we actually uh, scanned this indigenous woman from the Chikuna tribe. Uh, we had several indigenous consultants from different tribes on this project. Uh, and so you can see that she's in space and she takes you through this, you know, this very meditative breathing process where then you see this ball of energy, which is your ball of energy, and you can manipulate that. And the idea being that each person connecting their energies together can potentially make a huge uh, impact on the earth. Uh, here is an exhibition that we did uh, called Aya in her world of creative AIs. So this is the idea, we saw a lot of visitors of the museum were very worried about uh, the impact of AI and what it could be. Um, and so either to them, either it was, you know, the Terminator, you know, and it would you know, extinguish everybody, or it was an idea of, you know, kind of corporate, uh, very corporate, not, not connected to us. But in fact, there's many uh, exceptional use cases of AI that you could have with design, with creative fields, with uh, you know, with 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 regular you know, uh, working fields. So our our goal really was to show that. So we had AIs that could paint with you, that you could create music with, that you could um, you know, kind of interact with. So here you see uh, an AI. It says uh, triste, which is the same word in Portuguese, triste, and you can make a face uh, at it, and then it would bring back a meme to you because it had a facial recognition uh, software. And then basically uh, it could do that. But then our question is always, you know, if it, it can do this, but what else could it do? So for good and for bad, because we need to reflect obviously on these technologies. If, you know, uh, this technology is, is extremely problematic. Also, you know, facial recognition and uh, emotion recognition, because, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been shown to not be as accurate as possible. Maybe it's not completely accurate across uh, across domains, across cultures. So it's something we need to always question ourselves. And then to finish off the fellowship programs, uh, we have a program here, or this was a, this is a fellowship here by uh, 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 musicians and uh, VR artists. And so this was the first uh, real-time VR and music performance, artistic VR performance in uh, South America. This was in 2016, right when this uh, headset came out, uh, right around this he headset came out. Uh, this is a, a futurist who was our first, uh, our first uh, fellow, uh, Stuart Candy, an experiential fut futurist, very incredible person. Um, and he did, his project was uh, uh, pos Posterity, Posters from the Future. The idea with this was to create different types of posters that would then be posted around the city to make people stop and think, you know, what is this? So this one, this poster is showing, you know, that, uh, you know, in 20, in 20 years, in, in uh, 20 years uh, in Brazil, Brazil, there is no more, uh, there is no more hunger. So that's a positive feature, uh, as we were talking about today. So 
So these things are interesting. How can we put this in our world so that people can stop and reflect and maybe, you know, could we do this kind of future? So another example of the museum coming out. Um, Food on Mars was a project uh, by uh, another artistic resident, uh, Leila Snevele. And uh, this idea here was, how can we think about food in a different way? So on Mars, you know, from the research we've done, it's probably gonna be a lot of protein from, from uh, uh, spirulina sources, potentially, because uh, you can't really have herds of cattle and things like that. I mean, of course, you can have a food printer and things like that, but but as a base, as a proteic base, it's a very good base. And so we thought, you know, what are different things that you can put in there to make the food more palatable? So here you have different colors uh, that people are looking the food through, and then also these little um, white things that are underneath people's noses, so that they can smell different smells as they're eating them. Because you know, a lot of our our food, the taste is not just you know the food itself, but it's kind of the you know the smell that we get inside and so that's why you combine the smells also the colors so these all things have an impact and so this idea of prototyping it is seeing you know what impact does it have on people these are very rudimentary prototypes but you can see how this can actually you know get us to different areas as in you know vr with food and all these kinds of things was actually a project that was uh giving people carrot sticks but giving them a vr of eating uh french fries you know and actually it was a much more palatable experience um, and then also we had the first Samba written by an AI in the world. Uh, we wrote it there uh, with um, Harshit Argwal, who was a, our, um, our, our uh, resident uh, from the MIT Media Lab. Uh, we did an experimental boot camp also, which was uh, around kind of creating different uh, uh, VR experiences. So we ended up with three VR experiences, which were then shown in the VX, VFS DFX Festival. Um, so lots of experimentation around that. And then the technology in fashion, which was a, uh, you know, this, this kind of um, workshop of about um, five months where we had 14 designers and fashionists uh, here learning electronics, 3D printing, uh, so that they can then create clothing uh, that, that I had showed you before. So also workshop on IoT, um, this is a, a project we did with, uh, you know, kind of the Bartlett Interactive Architecture Lab uh, about thinking about responsive architecture. Um, and then, and then experimentation and prototyping. So work with artists, work with the, the, with the, the tech and art lab of the Federal University of Rio. And this, of course, was before COVID. And then, so what's what's important to, to know is that that really we work hard and play hard. Prototyping is hard work. Uh, it's a lot more failures than it is uh, successes. So uh, you know, this is you know when you innovate, it's really difficult because you will fail. And so it's good to have uh, you know kind of good good uh, environment to to prototype. So I want to change a little bit to why should you prototype. Um, and so we know these answers already of why, you know, we're facing several existential crises, uh, such as climate change, the decline of natural resources, the collapse of ecosystems and loss of biodiversity, uh, new pandemics, which we don't even want to think about, you know, some people are getting COVID again, <laughs> for like the third or fourth time. Uh, but, you know, we have to think about this uh, pollution, food insecurity, nuclear and biological warfare and uncontrolled technology. And why are, why are all of us needed, right? Uh, because of diversity, uh, creativity, new perspectives, uh, transdisciplinarity, unique solutions, and different geographies. Um, so this is where prototyping comes in. So this is the idea of turning ideas tangible and testing them. So why prototype, right? Prototype helps us capture, recalibrate, and test. So in the first step of the experimental process, we have a format to capture design concepts that are tangible into things that can be understood by others. Since we are always working with different groups, it's important to have this, um, this understanding. Uh, recalibration. So once ideas are in their physical form, it's possible then, you know, physical, whether it's paper, whether it's an actual prototype, uh, it's possible to rethink and recalibrate as new possibilities emerge. And then of course testing. So with a prototype, you can you can actually test uh, on users. You can refine. You can get more information in a low cost way. 
So some ideas, many of which I'm sure you have seen, uh, you can prototype using sketches. Uh, it's a quick and dirty way to do it. Uh, you can storyboard. So, you know, almost create a story around the, the user experience. What are the gaps there? Um, it's very helpful in pitching ideas. Uh, paper prototypes. So you're literally kind of like it's more tactile. You're creating with paper. It's very easy to manipulate. It's low cost. It's visual. It's good to use with stakeholders also so they can understand. Uh, user journey is more kind of how the user is moving through the whole process. So it's very detail oriented. Um, it's when you're farther along in the process and you can see different customer touch points, right? So you first do those first types of prototypes and then you can look at the, the different touch points. And then role playing is a good one too because you can actually model behaviors of users. Uh, and then you can see different issues that you might not have thought of before when you're going through the experience. So for us, when we created the uh, every exhibition, we would do the role play of the user, you know, of the user going into the exhibition, what's the flow like, you know, what if they miss the buttons? What if they close the screen? What happens then? So these are very useful uh, in real time. And also models. So physical and tactile models, these we've seen. Uh, they're useful for people who are non-designers and who may not be able to understand fully what we're talking about um, until they have a, a model that they can see. So here I'm just going to give you some, some examples of prototypes uh, and it being all about the mindset. Here you can see a prototype that we made um, with Luciano, who is a, a paraplegic um, uh, artist and he we basically you know kind of you can kind of see it there we're using a connect there which is a a tool which you find uh, uh you know uh, to to scan a person is using xbox and um we separated that and kind of like went around him with a circle but you can see it's already is not working you know so you know the first 10 times didn't work but then we are finally able to get uh, it to work and so uh, we were able to create a, a bust of his prototype and we were able to then uh, put the sensors that we wanted to put there so that uh, we could test out where the sensors were that he could track with his room uh, based on the sensors of, uh, that were on his head and on the shoulders. So it's very helpful in that way. And you know, prototypes really maximize the rate of learning by minimizing the time to try ideas. So you know, here you can see some clay prototypes, which are very useful when we did the project of uh, the, the fashion and tech. Here you can see us trying the prototype of kombucha. So these are all prototypes testing out different subjects. So what if the kombucha was with um, you know, the uh, uh, fabric? What if there were copper wire in it? Can, can it grow around co copper wire? Can it grow around regular wire? You know, so these are all things we didn't know because there's nothing written about this kind of stuff and the, this kind of way we wanted to use it. So, you know, and, and just to let you know, all of these did not go well. They, they all were a failure, but they taught us certain, certain things that were important. So it's really the error is the way. You can see here uh, this woman getting very, very, very uh, sick using the VR system. Uh, and that's how we see that this, it's, not a, it's, it's not well done and we have to go back and, and change it. So I think it's, you know, a, a look beside, besides other prototypes and, and what was interesting about these, for example, this is a prototype of a feijoada, which is a typical Brazilian uh, uh, beef stew, beef and bean stew. Um, and so we show the prototype, this is the final prototype, but the first prototype, uh, the uh, food uh, specialist said to us, this is, this is no good, this is no good, there's no texture here. And, and as human beings, we love our food to have different textures. And so based on her response, because we were able to show her prototype, we, you can see that this prototype has a ton of different textures. So you can imagine that for somebody who is a food, uh, a food creator, you know, a food researcher, this is very useful because then you can, okay, I see this, I see these things have more spiky, these other ones have more kind of like, you know, kind of like smooth, these other ones have like more kind of pockmarks in them. So these are all things that help people then create uh, a potential 3D food, for example. This interactive dress, for example, it's a prototype, you know, we were trying to do it and then we saw some computer wire, which was hanging around on the, on the, on the table. And then they decided to see if they could um, sew it together, almost crochet this computer wire. 
And because we've done that, it, it ended up working. And so we could put all the 300 LED lights in there. So they become a uh, sort of interactive uh, dress. And here you can see some shoes made from uh, kombucha. So this was a uh, very many, many prototypes. So you can see here that we were able to get a prototype that was uh, able to accept sewing. And that was, it was always uh, ripping before then. We could never get a sewing machine uh, to work on this. And this was, this was sewn, you can see this is uh, done in, in uh, this actually done in a shoe factory where one of our um, fashion uh, people worked in. So, so this, these all kinds of things uh, helped a lot uh, to, for us to be able to, you know, create these physical prototypes. Um, it helped a lot. So um, this is another example of a prototype. So we created this first and it's a well-being corset. So this corset actually has uh, this L wire, which is this electronic wire, which is this blue wire in front. And so there are sensors in there. So if the corset, if the, if the ambient noise goes above a certain decibel level, uh, the, the light will turn on. So this is talking about noise pollution in big cities, for example. So what if, you know, what if we can connect uh, noise pollution to high levels of stress? And what if somebody could have some, something along here or along you know, their, their clothing that can tell them that they are in an area of too much sound? So these are all things that we have to think about with this. Uh, 3D printed food is really around this idea of, you know, how can we look at the prototype? So this is not edible itself. Uh, this was more to see the size, the, 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 the way of the texture, you know, would this kind of 3D printing uh, work? So we tried it out with um, a different kind of, uh, uh, with, with a, a, a plastic and a resin first. Um, and then here is, you know, the food bites that we created after. So not based on that same prototype, it's on another prototype we did, but um, here you can see these are made by different uh, foods. You have kind of, you know, traditional ancestral foods. So things like insects, things like flowers, flowers are, are eaten in some, in some cultures, um, things like edible plants. So these are non-traditional uh, food plants, but also kind of very gastronomic, you know, high end, you know, kind of this idea of um, the gastronomic techniques of, you know, creating uh, uh, capsules and, you know, kind of encapsulation that people use in, in micro gastronomy and things like that. And here's, for example, another prototype that we did to see, uh, you know, with this biome smart farm, which was this idea of urban smart farms, that we could actually uh, create panels of um, spirulina, for example. So once we did this prototype, which was, you know, a more visual prototype, we saw that it might be too heavy to have these panels of spirulina, which were, are these green things over there? We thought they would be better to put them in a different way. So the prototypes are always helping you with this. And of course, this one I showed you guys, uh, Ripangia. This is our indigenous VR hologram. Uh, for This was the team uh, doing it. In the middle is uh, Veena Chikuna, uh, who we um, uh, uh, went through uh, and, and, and kind of captured. And so now just to finish off uh, a little bit of our talk today, um, these rapid fire exercises that I think will get us started thinking about this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, really the way to do these prototypes uh, in a sense is thinking about how to see differently. So how, how to see, right? So if I ask you, and if I ask most people, and if I ask uh, most amateur artists, for example, what is the color of the sea? Uh, so most people will say blue because that is the majority of what we see uh, on the sea. But in fact, this is the telltale sign that someone is an amateur artist, for example, because in fact, uh, the sea is um, a bunch of colors. So it's dark blue, light blue, white, a bit of brown, a bit of green, black. So these kinds of things are are really, you know, and in fact, it's very interesting because some amateur, some, some art professors, some art teachers tell people to take that thing that they're looking at and turn upside down, so that they're changing the mind because the mind is always trying to take shortcuts, you know, facilitate the mind's life. Um, the mind is an energy hog. So it's, all, it's you know, uh, it's about 2% of our body weight, but uses 25% of our energy. And so the same thing, you know, how can we see further? How can we see beyond? 
you know, so this idea of what you see, most people would see, uh, you know, a young businessman, but maybe there's something behind that we're not seeing. So how can we find that information? So, you know, maybe he's a closet entrepreneur besides being a businessman. Maybe he's a recycler. Maybe he's a dishwasher when he's at home. Maybe he's a K-pop lover. Uh, maybe he's, uh, with this for sure he is, repository for bacteria as we all are. Um, so, you know, what are these things that we can kind of really stretch our minds to think, think through and see? And so really it's about this idea of, you know, getting what we see, turning things upside down, doing the opposite, doing the anti-context. What if you took this, this idea, this prototype that I'm trying to make and took it out of its context? Maybe I put it way in the past or way in the future. What is the role of imagination? What is the role of the connection between the past and the future, right? So like I showed you guys the prototypes that were connected with the ancestral kind of food, uh, food ideas of food, but also connected with molecular gastronomy, for example. So um, that's what I would suggest uh, for all of us to, to think about. So as a, you know, I want to stop here if there's any kinds of questions or if you want to debate anything further. Um, you know, the idea here was to show you a bit of the work that we've done in the museum to go through some prototypes and why it's important to prototype for futures earthly, why we need everybody to think a bit beyond, behind, upside down and past future so that we can, we can all uh, be part of creating a better future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcela, for this uh, exciting and, and, and very, very creative and, and diverse, you know, show of all the things that you've done in the Museum of the Future. And um, I, uh, I will get questions from uh, the, the, the public, and, uh, but I, I also have a, a couple of, uh, of just first some, uh, some questions of, of like, there are so many things here. So who is actually involved in doing these things? Is that volunteers from the public? Is that just the 90,000 students you mentioned? Who, who is it who is doing the stuff? And that would be my first question. And, and, and that also in terms of, um, is it something that is only done by the museum? Or is this part of larger research project involving various stakeholders? So, so how, how is this, yeah. That's a great question. Actually, it, it depends. Um, so for most of these projects, uh, there were several types of ways that uh, visitors and users and people who are experts can engage. So sometimes we would do workshops that are for people who had no knowledge. Um, but then we had the residency projects, which were actually, uh, we, would, um, we would do a selection. So we would do a selection of people who were, um, in these areas. So for example, um, they would be, for example, on uh, for the fashion, fashion technology one that I showed, we did a selection uh, with a, a fashion partner. And so we looked at portfolios and we saw, you know, what kind of mix we want, what kind of mix do we want of technologists, of people who are doing women's clothing, men's clothing, accessories, all these kinds of things. Uh, people who could be, you know, uh, uh, and then we, we had the partners there. So we had uh, the cluster, which is a fashion uh, uh, group. We had uh, Biotecam, which was a biotech uh, uh, startup that helped us do the kombucha uh, fabric, the grow grown fabric. Um, and, we, and we then taught people, for example, we had, it was five month residency program where they were coming about two or three times a week. So for about three, four, five hours sometimes, you know, and they would come and they would learn. So we'd have atelier, we had workshops. So we'd come and learn 3D printing, you know, electronics, uh, biofabrics, you know, all these kinds of things. So that's one example of the of the fashion one. Uh, for the one of um, the food one was a different one. We did it. Uh, we partnered with a food research lab, and we also partnered with. We had a one resident on that one, so that was a uh, chemical engineer. And uh, he also made things around, so he knew a lot about polymers and all these kinds of things. And so he, we, we paired him with the team and the team helped him hack a 3D printer. The food um, scientists would come and so they'd come a few times a week and they would test different things. So we created a, a bio farm there. Uh, we had about 3,500 mealworms. We had 
35 cockroaches, uh, Madagascar cockroaches. So these are all very high in protein. We had spirulina growing. So then we would use this and kind of prototype with the 3D printer that was hacked uh, with, um, you know, other things. So it depended with the one with future of work. That is where we selected uh, 14 to 18 year olds uh, who were interested in participating and they created these futures and then uh, they were given to the designers from the European Institute of Design who then created um, some of these future prototypes which were then uh, uh, de developed by the lab and then put into the into the exhibition. So it really depends. But in these cases, in most cases where we had, they were in the exhibitions, these were actually, we wanted to work with experts. So people who were going to take these ideas outside and use them. And so just to finish uh, answering your question, uh, we had, for example, with the fashion and tech, um, we had people who started working with uh, solar panels on bags, who then went to solar panel creators and told them that it was not working for them. At that time that we were doing the project, a solar panel that was extremely flexible and thin, paper thin, came out, uh, and the supplier was in Belgium. And the person who was working with them was able to get some samples and said, you know, this is not working for this bag because it needs to be completely without lines with the way that they had them and stuff like that. So she was able to change the production line uh, for them because they saw this possibility. They had never thought of it before. Um, you know, for the the VR uh, boot camp, we had somebody who was able to think about, um, you know, the connection of VR and medicine. So he saw the connection of if you have photogrammetry, we taught that technique, which at the time you take thousands of photos and then um, something joins them together. So in the medical field, an MRI is some is thousands of photos, you know, hundreds or thousands of photos joined together. And so, you know, he thought of a, of a, of a, of a tool to go in to an MR, for the doctor to go into an MRI with a VR. So, you know, all these kinds of things, you know, that I told you about the, um, the, the biotech startup, which basically took this idea of creating, you know, they were helping, you know, to create um, these kombucha uh, pieces of fabric, these biofabrics. Uh, it became so popular that they became, you know, they ended up creating a whole new department in their company, which did uh, a lot more, you know, kind of these, um, how do you say these, these membranes for, you know, kind of pipes and stuff. And they created a whole new department. So it became one of the, the basically the, the biggest uh, uh, supplier of biofabric of uh, kombucha to to fashion to you know uh, uh, to artists and things like that. So so these kinds of things started there, and then they started gaining a life of their own in various ways, which is why we wanted to work with experts in the beginning. Thank you very much. I, I was I was asking the question because of the of course prototyping is something that is 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 not just for uh, uh, showing the future and exploring, but it's it's actually part of a design and production process. So you. You, you have, I, I was, I'm now starting to understand that you're actually uh, doing some training of people to prototype, but that's on a limited basis, that you're using this prototyping as, as a way to show something, some vision of the future, but you also try to include this uh, mostly in a way exposed with, with people who could actually use what's been prototyped somewhere or, or the ideas that came with it. And, uh... That's exactly it. That's exactly the idea. Because if we can show these kinds of things, then other people can say, wow, I never thought about that. If you can actually see the physical, even if it doesn't work completely, people, you know, several times I've heard in exhibitions, you know, why don't, why doesn't this exist already? You know, so this is something, and, and, and if we think that the future is something that we create with, you know, kind of our decisions, our projects, you know, all these kinds of things, then it's something that, prototyping, whether it's physical, digital, whether it's kind of with clay, whatever it is, or whether it's functional, it means that it becomes, it, the future seems to be pushed towards us. You know, we, we seem to be able to grab the future and bring it towards us a little bit more and it becomes possible. And so, and this is what startups do all the time, right? I mean, they, they often do it, you know, sometimes with, with uh, PowerPoints, but sometimes they have, you know, these these, you know, uh, uh, MVPs, you know, which are also prototypes, they show people and they get investment through that because it's a bit of a, of a vision of the future that you can get people around to work with, to, to invest in and all these kinds of things. As, as, as you know, in positive future, we're interested in 
providing visions for the future, uh, realistic visions, but we're also interested in how these things could uh, could become possible. So, so my my understanding is that this could also be a way to have some like crowd prototyping. It said, I mean, currently you're going like bottom up, you've got ideas, but I mean, you're not necessarily starting from a, a problem, but if, if this could be, I don't know, industries or government or various stakeholders coming with their problem, you have a wonderful prototyping lab where the public or people interested could come with their ideas. So, and the help of professionals. That is, is a more democratic way, in a way, to uh, draw ideas uh, in a very concrete manner that, that would maybe open the, the minds of uh, those who design to a different public. Because at the moment, the, this kind of work is done in various places, but it's done with a very specific population that are designers who have been trained in design schools. And these people have a sort of specific approach, right, to uh, what design is, but we don't have grassroots design. I mean, when you see how creative people can become in difficult conditions, I've got a colleague who works on favelas, for example, and it's absolutely amazing that the, how smart people are, are to use small amounts of resources. The example you gave of kombucha is, is an amazing one in terms of production, local of, of the raw material. Um, maybe that would be something interesting in terms of, uh, you said that, I mean, uh, uh, use your own hands and then there you have the hands of the public coming into your institution. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's interesting. I, I, I don't think we have enough spaces that are like that because our problems don't fit neatly into disciplines you know they transcend disciplines which is why it's important to have this and and why and why at, at the time the lab was so was so important because you don't have often times a designer talking to an artist talking to an engineer talking to a scientist you know they all speak different languages they hardly are in the same space together let alone kind of you know talking about um you know problems together so it's quite interesting in that sense where um, where I think we do need these spaces. I don't know how we can do that uh, uh, now, but I think we should we should really try because we have so many problems as we talked about. You know, kind of the climate challenge. You know, and there's there's a few areas that kind of uh, a few groups here and there that try to do it. But when you get specialists, specialists especially. Uh, who know their disciplines and who can connect around problems or around themes. So what we used to often do is get a big theme, like how to feed, so we have a big question is like how to feed um, 10 billion people in the decade of 2050. Okay, so we get, we start from there and then we, we go down. So, okay, what are the prototypes that we can do that make sense in this kind of area, which is an urbanized area. So we're not working in remote rural areas, we're working in urbanized area because, uh, you know, kind of in, in a few decades, 70% of the population is expected to live in urban areas. So, so that's how we start getting to the problem that we want to connect. Um, and we know that we can't just, you know, have traditional meat for everybody. And we know that, you know, at this moment, uh, you know, kind of lab grown meat has its own kind of energetic challenges. So what are things that we could do to to impact the taste, the smell, the look and feel so that people are eating a certain type of thing based on sustainable inputs, but that are not, you know, kind of having this, you know, the negative impacts of new technologies. Uh, and the same with the future of work and the same with all these kinds of things, because if you can actually see it, if you can actually see it physically, uh, visually, if you can experience it even as the best, then you can actually get people to see that it's possible to create these futures. I see. Jean-Eric, you wanted to say something or? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sadi. Thank you very much, uh, Marcela. Uh, I found uh, this experience fascinating. And uh, the, the fact that things uh, are then produced uh, in, in real uh, series, possibly, uh, whatever it is, uh, textiles, uh, food or others. It's quite an impressive uh, achievement. Uh, I have um, yeah, some, some, some comments and some questions. 
uh, I agree with Sadi with the idea of um, democratizing, in fact, the experience. It, it, it should uh, spread throughout uh, throughout the country to facilitate this, um, uh, I would say, experiment in, in design, including in the the, the poor areas. Uh, and be, be, there, there was um, uh, when I was working a long time ago at OECD, we, we promoted uh, an experience which was in fact developed in Denmark, which was called Innovation Workshops, in, in which uh, people could come in whatever it is, uh, so, some technical schools, for instance, and uh, they, they could just come at that time, it was in the, in the 70s, the 80s, uh, and, and try to, to propose uh, to develop some some objects, some some tools that would improve um, their day-to-day their, their -day life. And it was an open design, for, typically. So this is adapted now to, to your reality with a new type of uh, technology, including, including virtual reality. So definitively, it's something which, um, uh, which is also, I think, um, a possibility for democratizing. In a sense, it could also apply to, to the world as a whole. There, there is at uh, the UNESCO a program, which was called Future Literacy, in, in which people were, in fact, uh, um, proposed to, to, to develop their idea about the future, whatever the method is. It was a very open, no, no specific methodology. The idea is try to imagine the future of your city, try to imagine another way for your family to, to, to behave and so on. And it spread around the, the planet. There are hundreds of such experiments which were developed and which are now, in fact, um, subject to UNESCO chairs. So I think it, you, you can find inspiration, I would say, through this network. Th these are the comments. My, my question is, uh, uh, what have been for you the, the main challenge in, in this experience of prototyping? What, what have been for you the, the main uh, difficulties to, to be overcome, to, to develop this experience? Um, because uh, we, we see the, I would say, the nice uh, side of uh, the nice face <laughs> of the experiment. But what about the, the, the more, more difficult one with the obstacles that you've been uh, able to overcome or not able to overcome? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think that that's one of the reasons that maybe we don't have some of the innovations that we would like to have uh, is because it is very difficult to innovate, in fact, because when you're innovating, you're doing something that has really never been done before. And when and if you're if you're doing something and then it all it's always working, that means that you've done that before. So, so that was one of the big challenges that I think we have today, especially in the way that companies are structured, right? So you have often a very short-term view of things. Uh, you have quarterly earnings, you have to, you know, kind of you have a shareholder, you know, a shareholder, shareholder value. So, so sometimes uh, things that are getting funded are things that are that will make the shareholder wealthy rather than a stakeholder mentality of what we actually need. So I think that um, unless companies, and, and the, the reason I say companies because companies have, uh, uh, you know, where startups are often more. Um, uh, let's say disrupt, disruptive because they can be. They don't. They're not connected to shareholders. They often have people with an idea. They often don't have, you know, what we call what uh, Salim Ismail, you know, from from uh, formerly from Singularity University, calls the corporate immune system that kind of shuts down everything that's innovative, that's different, that's maybe going to put people, you know, you know, kind of shake things around, disrupt things. Uh, but corporations really, um, you know, given their size, especially the big ones, are the ones that are really going to have an impact. And so, you know, uh, when we look at, for example, things like water usage, where they say to, uh, for people, oh, don't leave the tap open when you're, when you're brushing your teeth, or oh, don't, you know, uh, uh, don't like take long showers. Okay, fine. But let's step back and see 
what is the impact in reality? So when we look at places like the US, you know, water usage 70%, uh, you know, around 70% is, is industrial use, you know? So even if 100% of the 30%, you know, didn't, you know, did the everything with the right, with a tap, with a shower, you know, it still wouldn't have an impact, which is why I think that, you know, you know, we need to have, you know, things like, you know, more looking on deep tech. And when you're talking to deep tech, which I have seen a lot here in, in Paris, and I think that there's, you know, more of a talk around that here um, uh, than in other places. Deep tech means that we're talking about 10 years, five, 10 years for somebody to develop it. But if nobody is making that now, then we won't have these kinds of innovations. And so that's the difficulty. It's how much time it takes, how much money it takes, you know, like going uh, going around the system of shareholder value to more of a stakeholder uh, value of you know what does a stake what does the world have uh, need and so this will also involve uh, policies which I think the EU is, EU is very more much more advanced than places like the US for example uh, or other countries and uh, it'll involve also kind of uh, demands by the public I think also. Um, and it'll it'll involve people to really finance and put their money where their mouth is and say, okay, we will finance this innovation that may cost you know millions, potentially billions of dollars over ten years and may not work, you know. And that's when we really get to the game changing innovations, you know. I mean, startups help, and when companies buy startups, you know, it's it's great, and you know, all, but it's really when we have this. Uh, you know, kind of people willing to, to look in a different way and not say we're looking at quarters or, you know, yearly basis or two yearly basis. You know, we're talking about 10 years and that is a lot for people to invest in, you know, whether it's governments or, 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 or companies uh, where, where something may fail. But that's what we need to do. We need to like have this kind of courage to, to invest in these things that may fail. Well, what I understand from what you said is that um, you are really in the real world, if I may say. Uh, this prototyping is not only a dream by uh, some people, uh, but it's also something which, at the end, will have to be produced, will have to be sold, and so on. And uh, in fact, the challenge is uh, getting the industrialists, the, the, the business people and so on, uh, really interested in it and really take the risk of investing in it, if I understand you well. It's not just yeah. uh, a game uh, that uh, you propose to some uh, nice people to, to play with it, uh, yeah. which uh, which for me is a bit, um, it's, it's a discovery, if I may say. <laughs> when I was listening to you, uh, uh, I didn't thought about think about uh, the, this dimension of uh, real application and investment behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Which make the 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 things more interesting. In fact. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was thinking, Sadi, uh, uh, about your model of installation. Uh, how does that apply to, to your concept of, of installation? Well, the, 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 the idea is that, uh, you know, when, when, when human uh, societies evolve, when people change things, they, they always try it on two levels, right? They try, uh, they make a thought experiment first, and that's different from nature. Nature just tries by, you know, uh, random trial and error uh, genetically and what works more or less survives it if it can reproduce and the rest disappears. Human beings do two things. They do the same kind of real world experiment and this is prototyping basically. So I make a model, or I make a prototype and I see if, if it works or not, right? And there's the other aspect, which is like a <clears throat> thought experiment, <clears throat> sorry. And then I don't even make the prototype if I think if I think it's wrong, right? So this is sort of a double, uh, and and the things we keep most work, you know, in the mind, uh, in the model, and in the reality. And so prototyping is a, is a bit a way of trying to uh, do something of both, right? Like not paying the full cost of trying the thing in reality, but you try it like in something that is 
very close to reality at a lower cost, you know, it's quick, quick and dirty, right? And, uh, and because it's very complex and to come back to installation of things that actually work, they have three layers, they have the physical, you know, affordances, and that's usually what we test with the real world prototypes. Then they have uh, the regulations, you know, the social control that uh, guides people. And then there's embodied competence. And this is what you learn when you use these things. And so at least the prototyping just checks if it, if it works in practice. And so you can actually test it and see if it's worth going further and maybe testing, but maybe you'll have to change the regulations afterwards. But so what I was really interested, I realized that, I mean, your museum of the future is actually a museum of the possibles, right? So you, you're, you're experimenting possible things that could become the future or visions of the futures from the past. And so I'm, I believe in prototyping, okay? In, in my past life, I've been working in, in you know, uh, uh, setting up uh, user labs and in industry, real stuff. And, and so what I have learned is that if you want to convince industry, this is not with words or, you know, uh, cases on paper, it's you have to show something, show, don't tell. I mean, that's the secret now because so many things are possible, but you want to see if it works or not. So you've gone one, one step further with prototyping. So now about curation, how do you keep the memory of these things? How do you display them so that people who are interested can make use of that experience? So all these things, what do they become? Videos? Uh, how do you store them? How do you show them? Is there a database? How is it indexed? You know, if I'm interested in say, I want to have new material to make fashion, but how do I get into all these experiments and prototypes? How do you show them to me? How do I access this? So that is, that is um, they are mostly on the uh, museum website, which is an archive that was created during COVID actually, because the lab was closed for a long time. And the, uh, and it's, 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 it has been different now. And now I live in Paris, so I'm not living there anymore. I'm not, I'm not in, in, the, in the museum anymore, but um, they are, they're really, they, they, you know, we're in a weird moment because everything was closed. <laughs> So, so, uh, but they're in the, they're in a, a database called Amanyateca, which means like the library of tomorrow, essentially. So it's there, um, but it, that's one of the things that I wish were, were better. It, you know, that's in full honesty, you know, it was great when they had the exhibition, we had a little bit uh, of, of, of documentation around that, but um, that is something that could be worked on better. <laughs> because in museums, many times, you just don't collect the stuff that you have collected yourself. You collect stuff from somewhere else. So uh, yeah. this museum of the future, is that only stuff that's been done in Rio? Or are you like trying to capture all the prototyping that's been done in thousands of design schools in industry? Would you like to capture what was successful prototyping that has not yet been used? You know, for real, if you look at Leonardo da Vinci's, you know, sketches, a lot of the stuff that he had were like mental, yeah. but also physical. And, you know, thousands, I mean, hundreds of years later, these things suddenly became usable because the technology or the industry made that possible. And suddenly these things that were the future in his mind became the present. So uh, are there any plans of you to collect more of these, uh, you know, prototypings? Well, it wasn't really a, a, an idea of collecting them. The idea was really to actually create them within a, in a very time bound way. We also had a, a project called Hacking Mars, which was a six month, um, which was a six month process where we had uh, designers, meditators, uh, scientists, uh, engineers, architects work on the idea of what could a human civilization on Mars look like, you know, on various dimensions like you know, governance, societal, environmental, um, you know, kind of, you know, economic and you know, all these kinds of things. Um, but, you know, it's really about the doing. And I think that now the challenge that, you know, that I would pose to uh, whoever watches this is how can you do this within your organization? How can you do this, you know, across organizations? 
that's really the challenge is, is, you know, what are the problems that most would move the needle, particularly uh, in, you know, regarding climate change, I would say, uh, and what's worthwhile to, to most work on. So there's a book called Project uh, Drawdown, which is are a bunch of ideas uh, that were cataloged on, you know, about climate change and things like that. So there's tons of ideas that people could do within, you know, on big problems that need solving uh, that in whatever way they can, people should work on them, bring them into their companies because, you know, as they say, you know, as Peter Diamandis and everybody says, you know, if you work on a problem that affects a billion people, you will become a billionaire. So, so there's tons of problems. There's, that is not an issue. There's tons of problems we can work on. And I would really kind of hope that everybody could come away with this, with this idea of how can I bring this prototyping mindset? How can I bring this, this idea of creating things within my own company to guide them towards the future, to guide you know, the, this future that I want? I hear, but what I mean, for example, your, your example of March, right? There is currently in the National Agency for Research and Technology, INRT, a project that is called Objective Fluid. And it's exactly like, how can we live on the moon, right? And so, and I'm sure that in many countries you have similar projects and there have been experiments, et cetera, et cetera. So a museum of the future is, is the place where you could collect, curate all these things, uh, you know, beyond what has just been produced locally in, in Rio. And because and, you have the know-how, you have the knowledge, you now have the legitimacy and you have interiority of this. There, there's, I'm not aware of any other museum of the future of that kind, is there, or? There, there are a few actually now, there are a few. Uh, the Museum of Tomorrow is one of the first ones, um, but there's Futurium in, uh, in Germany. There is the Museum of the Future, which just opened in Dubai. Um, you know, several of them have looked to the example of the Museum of Tomorrow, but I think these are, are the, the Futurium is, is uh, have similar themes. Um, and the Museum of, the, of, of Dubai, I think it has more specific examples. The Museum of, of Tomorrow is more focused on this idea of possibilities and the idea that the future is not written. It's something that we can create. So like how to think with that mindset. So that's, that's really what the, the case is. Yeah. If I may uh, suggest um, something in line with what said he said, in fact, what you need is a kind of uh, museum of the future without walls. Uh, in which you, you would capture in a kind of uh, world uh, virtual library uh, this type of uh, experiments or um, prototyping that you, you exist all over the world in concrete terms and you would have i would say uh, access to, to 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 it by uh, by video and things like that like that you, you should try to develop that with the institute of um, advanced studies in, in Paris and the other ones. Sounds uh, like a good idea. <laughs> kind of a uh, 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 big uh, world um, museum without... We, 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 in Positive Future, you have, you know, about our scientific advisory board created this uh, resource database to feed people with what could work possibly in, in the future. And, and this is exactly what you guys are doing. And so, we would, I mean, really welcome your, your suggestion. I think, I think your initiative is extremely important, precious, and because we now have an enormous anxiety, and you said that at some point of what is going to happen, and you know the collapse, and you listed all, all these all these reasons of why we should do something, and we have millions of, I mean, especially the some recent generations who are completely you know, uh, depressed with this. And, and you offer here a positive possibility of suggesting some, some things. And so uh, uh, while this, this, is, this is great for people in Rio, but uh, the fact that a lot of your stuff is actually uh, digital but on VR or it's been filmed, you are becoming a resource for hope and, uh, and of concrete hope uh, because making drawings or, or talks or papers is one thing, but just showing the thing is completely different. And this is what you're doing. And so, uh, uh, I mean, I, I would, we would love if you would sort of grow larger, get in touch with these 
sister institutions you just talk about in, in, in Dubai, in Germany, wherever. And uh, because what you're doing is exactly what uh, the current generations need of like, what should we do now? And this is exactly what you're what you're offering. So do you have any programs for this? What are, um, I mean, this is not just a, a museum, this is an endeavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's so, so I'm not with the museum anymore, but, uh, but uh, you know, I'm a super supporter, and of course, I was I, I created the lab uh, before the museum was even open. So it is a it is a it is a dear spot. It's it's a soft spot for me. Um, but I think that you know it, it shouldn't, as you said, it shouldn't only be in Rio. I mean, everybody should be thinking about how they can do. So how can we like get this idea and put it forward and 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 have it so that people can create in their companies, in their universities, and and have this idea of how can we make these, these, how can we go forward in the future and then come back and then kind of go even farther? If we are thought so far, far forward and we backcast and then we kind of go forward, we can go much, much farther. So, so that's really, I think this, this mindset, this prototyping mindset is so important of, you know, not just, you know, the, the, the camp of ideas, because all ideas are wonderful when, you know, when you don't build them. <laughs> When you build them, you see the thing doesn't work. The code is, you know, yeah, it's a whole other other scenario. So, so I think that you know, as as much as people can be interested in doing this themselves, bring it to their own life and their own kind of locus of of power of of influence. You know, I think that that's the that's the ideal thing because if there's more people thinking about solutions, we'll have better solutions. And I, I mean, who who um. Who is ready to fund that stuff? That is a question that it's 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 tough because you know the museum we didn't have uh, at, at a, after a certain point we did not have uh, municipal funding anymore. Ours, you know, um, it was created by the the municipality plus uh, uh, you know kind of with funding from Santa Jair Bank. Um, but then after a certain point, there was no funding, so we had to go in and. And, and really kind of build up uh, capacity for sponsorship. So we had a sponsorship director and then uh, for several years, it was 100% of the, of the money from the museum was based on sponsorship. So this is based on uh, about four, I think 13 or 14 companies that we spoke with and we developed projects. Um, you know, they were not allowed to uh, comment on the content of the, of the project. That's the agreement we had with them. But you know, if you see something in, in connected to innovation, something connected to sustainability. So we had companies like Engie, for example, is on the board and also supported uh, initiatives there. We have uh, other companies like you know uh, Intel, IBM, uh, Santander Bank. You know, so each of these, the idea was how to connect these these big enterprises and companies to. Kind of innovative work that we're doing there, whether it's in development of publics, whether it's in you know kind of innovation work that I was doing, whether it's work that you know people were doing you know in sustainability and and all this kind of stuff. So it really depends, but I think it's really kind of bringing the different sectors together. Hey, what you are saying is that um, there might be possibility with the, the big company to to get them, in fact, funding this type of uh, work, which would appear as a kind of common, uh, kind of comments for um, possible solution for mankind, in a sense. Uh, but but um, try to, to collect that uh, from uh, all around the world in a kind of uh, one resource database. Uh, that's, yeah. yeah. Uh, but, it's, um, it's, the, it's the usual suspects again uh, who fund this kind of thing. It's the large, precisely global corporations. Yeah. Uh, we don't seem to have found uh, the right way. And it is perhaps something that governments should think about in terms of uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, syndicating the, the money or taxes and put some percentage of it in these kinds of comments because we. I mean, what you say about the municipality of Rio not funding that, that, that thing, this, this is uh, the usual problem with these very smart and, and commons and initiatives that they get funded in the beginning. And then after five years, 
people say, well, I mean, this is really nice, but now you have to be self-funded. I mean, a common is never yeah. self-funded. And, uh, and that is, is, that is like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you and you have gone through this experience effectively. Yeah, yeah. and we we all have. But then, uh, since since we see that these things are productive, indeed, when they are funded, perhaps at some point we should uh, sort of like uh, take stock of this and and understand that if indeed these things are productive when they are funded, perhaps you know even if it doesn't look as nice because it's not new anymore this is why people stop funding because you get less twitter uh, you know if it's just uh, renewing instead of creating something yes. but uh, on one hand you know we have to find new models for funding this and on the other hand i understand that that people who fund need their voters and shareholders and stakeholders to sort of uh, admit that this is useful and we have to perhaps to find new ways of uh, showcasing what's being done and, and and my feeling is that you have like interesting spectacular stuff that that can show what comes out of this and so perhaps this is this is a way to uh, justify why this is continuously funding uh, uh, this continuous funding is justified because usually what people want is something new to show or a new story to tell but with prototyping, this is exactly what you're producing on, on I mean, almost a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. What, what, yes. what could be done is to, uh, to showcase, uh, I would say, the success stories, if I may say. It's saying this was, in fact, designed and uh, it was then produced and you see how it changed the world and the local uh, situation at least. Did you get a lot of media coverage for these things that you produced? We did. We did a lot of media uh, from 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 the Future Channel, from uh, Global, which is one of the biggest uh, media conglomerates in the world. So, so it did. It did. That did happen. Uh, but I think that the challenge is how do you translate that into into examples that can be seen? And and I think that there's different problems that that we have, and there's different contexts. And I think that. Uh, it's more the mindset, I would say, more the mindset of how you can uh, adapt it to, to different places. And it's the thinking process, really, the thinking, the connecting, it's the, it's the, it's, that is the process that should be replicated rather than the actual, you know, final output, you know, because there, we're always getting new technologies, new possibilities, you know, so I think that, that it's really how, how do you think about these things, how do you connect people, how do they work together, I think that's really the, the key. And that's that's the key for um, addressing the coming challenges of big, big transformation because we should all uh, become local designers of the solutions to our local problems. Exactly. So that's, exactly. that's what has to be created. Right. Now, are there any more questions or comments or things that you would like to, to say? And uh, this is a question to everyone, including you, Marcela, because maybe you have a some kind of important message that you didn't have the opportunity to pass and and so we're all ears. Yeah, I think I think I think that I would I would end by saying, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation, lovely invitation to to chat with you guys. And uh, and I think what I would say is that um, if everybody can take this prototyping mindset, if everybody is seeing something, even in the smallest uh, element that they can see that it can be better. You know, try it, try it, and and fail and fail better, and and that way with this mindset, you know, I think that if everybody imagine what we could do if billions of people had this mindset every day, you know, that would change the world. And so that's what I would say if we can if we can keep this prototyping mindset of seeing you know, with curiosity what can be better, how can I look at this differently, how can this be better in the future, how can we make it more sustainable, how can I uh, connect to the ethical axes or, you know, kind of my ethics to this, this situation. Uh, I think it's really around that and, and trying it out and trying it out and not being afraid to fail because you will fail <laughs> and it's not fun, but it's, it's fun. It's fun when you, when you're able to, you know, finally after several, several tries, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to get it right. Well, thanks. And failing together is always fun. It's true. <laughs> It's true. Well, thank you for this very positive and encouraging note. 
And uh, and on that, I, I would really like on 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 the name of uh, Positive Future and all the future viewers. Uh, uh, Thank you so much, Marcela, for sharing with us all that uh, wonderful work you, you've done with your colleagues uh, at the museum. And um, we hope that we will have also maybe in our repository some of the interesting stuff that you have created. And so please feel free to send them to us because this is exactly what we want to show and disseminate. The future is ours. Thank you so much again. and. Uh, well, we'll, we'll uh, meet again soon uh, to another fascinating webinar of Positive Future.